We begin today's show in New Mexico, where new details are emerging about a former far-right Republican candidate who lost his bid for a seat in the New Mexico State House by a landslide this past November, but refused to concede his loss, was arrested by a SWAT team Monday for orchestrating shootings at the homes of four Democratic officials. Police say the suspect, Solomon Pena, paid four men to shoot at the homes of two county commissioners and two state legislators. This is Albuquerque Police Acting Commander Kyle Hartsock. After the election in November, Solomon Pena reached out and contracted someone uh, for a, a, a amount of cash money to commit at least two of these shootings. The addresses of these shootings were communicated over phone. Within hours, in one case, the shooting took place at the lawmaker's home. In the series of attacks, Bernalillo County Commissioner Adrian Barboa's home was shot at multiple times on December 4th. On December 8th, incoming New Mexico House Speaker Javier Martinez's home was shot at. Then, on December 11th, the former Bernalillo County Commissioner Debbie O'Malley's home was shot at. Finally, on January 3rd, New Mexico State Senator Linda Lopez's home was shot at. No one was hurt, but the bullets from a Glock pistol did fly through the bedroom of Lopez's sleeping 10-year-old daughter. Solomon Pena is accused of trying to participate in the last shooting himself, but his gun jammed. He appeared in court Wednesday to face multiple charges, including aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, criminal solicitation, and four counts each of shooting at an occupied dwelling. Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller said the shootings were politically motivated. I also know that, fundamentally, at the end of the day, this was about a right-wing radical, an election denier, who was arrested today and someone who did the worst imaginable thing you can do when you have a political disagreement, which has turned that to violence. Authorities say Pena actually visited the homes of his four targets in the days prior to the tax and tried to persuade them his election had been rigged. Video obtained by the Albuquerque Journal appears to show Pena to former residents of one of those targeted, former Bernalillo County Commissioner Debbie O'Malley. Doorbell camera footage shows him asking to speak to her. Hi, my name is Solomon Pena. Can I speak with Debbie O'Malley? Okay, well, the public record says she owns it. Uh, do you know where she lives? And then he went to the house where she lived. It was that house that was shot at. For more, we're joined by two guests in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Debbie O'Malley joins us. She's the former Bernalillo County Commissioner in New Mexico, was one of the four Democratic elected leaders in the state whose house was attacked in the shootings, allegedly orchestrated by Solomon Pena. And in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we're joined by New Mexico Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver, who is a Democrat. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Debbie O'Malley, let's begin with you. So we see this video footage of um, Solomon Pena going to property you own, asking for where you live. Can you talk about what happened then on the uh, what happened next? You actually spoke to him. That was well before uh, your house was shot up. Yes, uh, it was uh, right after uh, the uh, residents told him where I lived and and. That's not unusual. Uh, we, once in a while, constituents will, will drop by for some reason. But normally, people are very respectful of, uh, of I think, elected homes here in, in Albuquerque uh, and don't want to, you know, disturb them while they're at home. Uh, he did go directly to my house. Uh, there's a video where he shows, uh, shows him approaching my gate. And, uh, and then, uh, there's a clip also where I, I meet him there. He's waving his arms, trying to get my attention. So I walk over there to talk with him. And uh, that's when he, um, you know, tells me that he felt that he was cheated out of uh, the uh, the election that he had actually won, that it was rigged. And uh, <clears throat> he said, I knocked on all these doors and, you know, I should have more votes. and. And on and on. And I did tell him, you know, that doesn't mean that you get votes if you see people or knock on doors. That's not the same. You know, it doesn't equate to votes. And he became very agitated and he had me a stack of papers, not a big stack, small stack. 
I, I did scan them uh, after I received them uh, and uh, on my way back uh, into my home. And I could see that there was a letter, you know, stating the same things he told me and that he wanted my response, you know, immediately. I did see the rest of the paper scanned them, and clearly those had been downloaded from a website uh, that talk, you know, that, <clears throat> that um, moves the, the, you know, the narrative forward about voter fraud. Debbie O'Malley, describe what happened on the night of December 11th when your home was attacked. And of course, this would be, you know, a month later. <clears throat> Well, my husband and I were sleeping. It was the middle of the night. I think they determined it was close to two o'clock in the morning, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we heard this loud banging. And I described it as someone, you know, knocking on our door with their fist. It was so loud. We both sat up at the same time, <clears throat> and um, we heard more of that sound. And we just realized it was it was gunfire. We did get up. Uh, I did look to see. Uh, uh, where, where my uh, the gate cam was, and uh, it didn't lit up. No one of the security lights were li were lighting up. We figured nobody was on the property, and uh, went back to bed. And uh, my husband didn't discover the the uh, gunshots on the wall, the holes on the wall, bullet holes, until the next day. And then uh, I wasn't even home at the time. He he did uh, took a photograph and texted it to me, and we were like, whoa! I was pretty shocked to see that. So soon after that, we did call the police. And what did the police tell you? Did they come immediately to your house? Well, they did. They sent a team out. Uh, they checked the area for casings. Uh, they, um, yeah, they, I met with a detective at the time. <clears throat> I did mention that the only thing unusual was this visit from um, that individual, Pena. And, um, and they, you know, you know, they did take that information. And uh, so I didn't hear anything, really. I, I think that there was much more focus when Senator Lopez's house was was shot at. I mean, this, uh, I think they realized that there was something going on. Um, I, I, my husband was very worried about it. He was suspecting something was going on earlier than that, that these weren't just isolated things. So, so that's when I believe the New Mexico State uh, Police got involved and then um, <clears throat> FBI and others got uh, really focused, and this became a priority for this, for, for uh, law enforcement here in Albuquerque. And as you said, when um, State Senator Linda Lopez's home was shot at, um, her daughter, 10-year-old sleeping daughter, was um, nearly hit. She talked about um, uh, the dust uh, that um, uh, um, was on her as a result of the bullet flying. Um, in the complaint, and I want to bring in the New Mexico Secretary of State here, um, the complaint citing an unnamed source said Solomon wanted them to aim lower. These are the um, people he allegedly hired to shoot at the houses, though he apparently was involved with one of them and his gun jammed. Solomon wanted them to aim lower and shoot around 8 p.m. because occupants would more likely not be laying down. He wanted to hit someone, New Mexico Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver. You run the election uh, apparatus system in New Mexico, as all secretaries of states do in their states. Your house, personally, was not shot at, though you went into hiding last year. Talk about what's going on here, this political violence at home. Sure. Well, thank you for having us on uh, to talk about this important topic. You know, I've been an election administrator in New Mexico at the local and now at the state level for the last 16 years. And of course, the last two years, I think, have been unprecedented in terms of the violent political rhetoric that we are all being exposed to as election officials. And now, of course, we can see the through line with Mr. Pena, a, a radicalized uh, pro-Trump supporter who not only took threats that he made uh, toward me personally and other election officials, but obviously into actions against uh, former Commissioner O'Malley and our other friends and colleagues. And I think, you know, this is a topic that I've been talking a lot about with the public, that, 
you know, because of the big lie and because of the mis and disinformation that has been spread through a certain portion of the population so extensively over the last two years, we have now seen individuals like Mr. Pena, frankly, somebody who already had a criminal record in the past, uh, who might have been already disposed to commit acts of violence, taking that rhetoric as truth and changing from uh, a pattern of verbal or social media-based threats into actions. Um, I'm very grateful for law enforcement in our state, for the Albuquerque police and the state police, the FBI, to have acted so quickly once this pattern of actual violence was established and to take quick action to uh, in, obtain and, and arrest those uh, who were involved. But what concerns me is that this may not be uh, where this, you know, radicalized behavior based on lies and mis and disinformation end. Maggie, could you explain, as you mentioned, Pena had a criminal record. So how is it, first of all, that he was able to run for political office at all? And how did he get access to guns? Well, I don't know the answer to the second question. I think our members of law enforcement would be better equipped with that information. But what I can tell you, in New Mexico, we have a little bit of a disjoint uh, in terms of our laws around candidacy and holding office. So in New Mexico, a, a someone who has been convicted of a felony cannot hold a public office. However, there is no such prohibition for somebody to uh, seek office and be placed on the ballot. So the, the grand irony of Mr. Pena's, uh, you know, candidacy is that although he could run for office, he could he could never have actually assumed office had he won the election. But as you already stated, you know, this was a this was a landslide loss, um, and it wasn't even close. Um, and so, you know, the allegations of election rigging are just ludicrous. He lost by something like fifty percentage points. Um, but if you could tell us, Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse-Oliver, why you went into hiding last year. Following the 2020 general election, as I think folks are, are very aware, um, there was a, a tremendous campaign orchestrated by former President Trump and his supporters to cast aspersions and doubts. Of course, we saw the most uh, visual and violent culmination of that with the January 6th insurgency attack on the Capitol. Um, however, I and many of my colleagues from around the country who conduct elections on both sides of the aisle, independents, uh, we were subjected to a massive doxing campaign that ultimately uh, turned out to be orchestrated by the Iranians. Uh, it was a website called Enemies of the People. My home, along with the home of uh, about 70 other election officials from around the country, uh, photos of our homes, our home addresses, our personal private information was posted on this website. Uh, and uh, they went so far as to create a, a Bitcoin wallet to collect donations uh, for bounties uh, for individuals who may be so inclined to commit acts of violence against us. So yes, I had to relocate from my home. Uh, I had a police, state police protection detail for several weeks uh, until that website was ultimately taken down and until some further security measures could be taken to keep my, my home safe moving forward. Debbie O'Malley, could you talk about what you think needs to happen, what your concerns are now? <clears throat> well, I mean, that that's question has been asked uh, of me uh, many times now, uh, what needs to happen. And I, I, I don't—if you're talking about security or how to secure, uh, you know, uh, uh, our uh, our homes and our you know to so that uh, we're not vulnerable. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, I'm a local official. People, I've, I've lived here. I was born in Albuquerque. Family's been here for many generations. I uh, my constituency knows who I am. Uh, they see me at the grocery store. If they need to get a hold of me, they can. Uh, you know, that's that's the life of a local official. Uh, am I supposed to have a detail follow me all, all everywhere? Well, that's not you know that's that's not feasible to have that happen. Uh, 
So uh, obviously my vulnerability level was increased greatly. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I you know, certainly have a higher alert in terms of my safety and security. And we're doing what we can there. But, uh, you know, other than that, I don't have the answer. The access to guns is anybody can pick up, get a gun. I mean, we see this everywhere. And, and people don't think twice about using it. So um, I don't have the answer for that. We're going to end with uh, New Mexico Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver. Um, if you can comment overall on the climate now, I mean, you have the chair of the secretaries of state, Jenna Griswold. She's the secretary of state of neighboring Colorado, um, uh, who uh, lobbied to get bodyguards as well. Are we seeing this all over the country, not only for secretaries of state who run elections, but um, local level officials i mean what is do you feel the country coming to at this point do you see this white supremacist violence um far right violence uh as only increasing at this point what needs to be done well, it's a good question. You know, interestingly, I was just doing interviews a couple of months ago talking about how election officials around the country, and myself included, were, were heaving a huge sigh of relief post the 2022 election because the level of violence and threats of violence did seem to be uh, significantly lessened over 2020. Um, however, I, I warned at that time, and I obviously um, have to say now that we don't think that that is over, uh, that, uh, you know, particularly as we head into the 2022 election, particularly as we have former President Trump seeking the nomination once again. And of course, it is, it is he uh, and his supporters who have been the most uh, virulent uh, in terms of making lies and accusations about the election process, you know, that, again, we can see that through line of what happens when you have this heightened rhetoric uh, translated into action. So to answer your question, yes, I think we are still security of election officials and public officials in general uh, now is top of mind. In my state uh, here in New Mexico, we are going to be looking at some pieces of legislation to keep public officials, private uh, home information less public, to make it less public. Um, and we are also continually seeking more funding and resources for security measures for those of us who run elections. Um, now we are also going to have to look at all of our public Public officials. Um, New Mexico is a very accessible place. It's a small place. It's very community-based. As Commissioner O'Malley was saying, folks are used to knowing who their elected officials are, where they live, how they can get in touch with them. Now we have to try to strike a balance between that access and the security of our public officials because of this increase and, and of course, the recent events of public, uh, excuse me, of political violence here. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us. Maggie Toulouse Oliver, New Mexico Secretary of State, speaking to us from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Debbie O'Malley, former Bernalillo County Commissioner. Her home was shot up by a right wing Trump supporter who denies the election results. In his own case, he ran for the state legislature. Coming up, we'll look at Azerbaijan's month long blockade of the disputed area of Nagorno Karabakh, a home to mostly ethnic Armenians. And then you'll meet the climate scientist who is fired from her job in a federal lab for her climate activism. Stay with us.